Well, let me start off first by telling y'all, if, if you've never done this before, this, this is an intimidating position to be in, not because of you folks sitting out there, it's because I'm following Jim Estes and trying to fill in for him. He does such a great job, and, and, and sometimes no matter how good a job you feel like you do, you feel like you're, you're not worthy enough to, to follow his footsteps. So I'm going to try my best this morning. Uh, I, I don't know about y'all, but I've been a little confused the last two or three days. I, I've gotten up and gone outside, and the sun's been shining for the last three or four days. So hopefully hopefully that type of weather's here to stay. I, I, we've had enough rain at Wheeler, and I'm sure everybody else has had enough rain as well. If you will, uh, go ahead and turn to James chapter 3. We're going to be, our lesson is, is going to be derived from James in chapter 3. And, and uh, let me add to it that... Uh, over the years that I've done Sunday morning classes or Wednesday night classes, I, I sort of felt like that I had to stand up here and preach and preach and preach, and I, and I finally had convinced myself that's not necessarily what we do in this Bible study. It's, it's to study scriptures, to study facts. It's to, to talk about things and, and how they relate to us and all that. Greg's going to do the preaching uh, here a little bit after a while. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, please don't think that all this came from my wisdom because it didn't. I, I've got a lot of information and probably what we're going to do, what I'm going to do is, is stand up here and read a lot of information to you, then we're going to talk about it. And I always worry about running out of soap. I, I feel like I've got information, information, and I catch myself going way too fast a lot of the times, and I wind up running out of soap even though I had plenty. So if, we, if I do that this morning, forgive me for that. That'll leave us plenty of time to... to talk with each other before services start. But if you found James chapter 3, and, and also I'll probably have two or three verses that I'll need someone to read, and, and please, it doesn't matter if it's the same person that reads every verse I ask for, just uh, help me out with that if you can. It won't be a whole lot as we go. But uh, let me read James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and then we'll, we'll get into what our, what our topic's about today. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, Yet they are turned about <clears throat> with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place, place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. Now, with those verses being read, can anyone guess what we're going to talk about today? Brother Hodgett, I know you can. Feel free to speak up back there. You, you've, uh, Brother Hodges has been on a long Seattle's where you've been, right? So I'm, we're glad to see you back. Glad you made it back safely. But I do expect you to help me out in here this morning. Okay, fair enough. Uh, if, if you're not familiar, uh, Mel and I have a book, uh, and I don't know who the publisher is, but it's called "All of the Devil's Apples Have Worms." Have any of you ever seen this book? If you don't have that book, I would recommend you get that because it's got a lot of great lessons in there that apply to everyday life. Uh, it's, it's, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And the, the lesson we're going to talk about today, it just so happens, it's entitled, Don't Trip Over Your Tongue on the Way to Heaven. And as small as our, our tongue is, it's one of the strongest muscles in our body. And, and everybody, I think you know that if you've been in any Bible class before that's talked about that. Uh, it can destroy a single man or it can destroy thousands of men. 
with, with very little effort. And that's something from time to time we all need to do a self-check and, and be sure that we've got that in check. And it's hard to control. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. So just be patient with me. I'm going to do a lot of reading this morning. I'll try to go slow enough. If you want to jot some things down, you can. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. Stephen Powell told of a man who lit a fire in his grate and went outside to get more coal. Upon returning, he noted that a log had rolled out of the grate and set the log box on fire. He picked up the burning box and hurried to throw it out into his yard. As he did, he brushed the curtain that covered the front door. Upon returning, he noted that the curtain and the door were in flames. While phoning the fire station, he also noticed that the log box he had thrown out into the yard had set fire to his car. He rushed out with a bucket of water, but in the process, he tripped over a gasoline can, which splashed gas on him and the surrounding area. By then, a neighbor had called the fire station. By the time the firemen arrived, they found the entire place aflame, including the man who started it all. He was trying to leap out of his clothes. A fire usually begins with a small spark, like a match or an ember in the wrong place. In the same way, the wrong word can spark an emotional fire that becomes a raging, uncontrolled agent of destruction we never intended to happen. We should heed God's advice to be slow to speak. Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address over 140 years ago. And let's compare his words with some other kinds of communications we have, and I found this sort of fascinating when I come across this. The Gettysburg Address contained 272 words. That's hard to believe. I've never actually counted them. I've read it dozens of times. A bag of Lay's potato chips has 401 words. An IRS form 1040EZ, and Jeremy's probably seen enough of these in the last month or so, contains 418 words. And the average USA Today cover story has over 1,200 words in it. <clears throat> the average teen speaks enough, and, and this may not be accurate, the average teen speaks enough in one week to fill a 500-page book. In the average lifetime, that would be 3,000 volumes. The average person uses 26,800 words a day. That's 9,782,000 words a year and 733,650,000 words in a lifetime if you live to be 75 years old. Do we really need to use that many words? A wise person learns that the quality of one's word is more important than the quantity. The Declaration of Independence used only 1,821 words. Moses used only 400 words to describe the creation of the world. God used only 297 words to give the Ten Commandments. Someone said, He who thinks by the inch and talks by the yard will likely be moved by the foot. Many of the words people choose bring no glory to God and do no good for man. We should be slow to speak. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about some reasons this morning, and then we're going to get into uh, some, some more uh, detailed topics on reasons why we should watch what we say, watch our words. And, and there's four of them, and if you want to jot this down, feel free to do so. I'll, I'll call them out, and then we'll go back and cover them. It can ruin our religion. It can lead to condemnation. And sometimes those words may have to be eaten, and you all all know what that means. And plus, it can put us in danger of sinning. So let's talk a little bit about how words can, re can ruin our religion. And, and it's covered there in James 1 and verse 26. A bad mouth can ruin our reputation with others and our standing with God. Thomas Fuller said, birds are entangled by their feet and men by their tongue. We must bridle the tongue with self-control before others bridle it for us. Be ye not, and we read this earlier, be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit or bridle, lest they come near unto me. A sentence may seem like a small thing, but it can lead to big results. Somebody elaborate on that. What, what's, what's that telling us other than it's pretty common there that 
why, why would you need, and JT, and, uh, Luther's not here this morning, so you're going to have to fill in with all this country living folk stuff, okay? Why do those horses and mules need those bridles and bits? Why would those horses, it talks about horses and mules having bits and bridles. Why, why is that needed? Direct their path or control them in, in, in one of a few ways. And, and if we took the time, all of you could probably come up with some human that, that you would love to see those bits and bridles on, but we won't get into that detail today. But what, what this is talking about, little bitty things, and, and all of you may have experienced this before, can turn into something big. And, and Mr. Hodges and myself, if any of you in here are educators, you deal with that on a daily basis, how something's said at break, and then by the time that third or fourth or fifth kid gets their spin on it, it's already rolled out of control. And, and let me show you an example of what I'm talking about, about something small turning into something big. A squirrel, now we're talking about a little two-pound, three-pound animal, okay? Let me, let me do the story. I want you to realize how big of an effect a little small squirrel had. A squirrel climbed on the Metro North Railroad power lines near New York City. This set off an electrical surge, which weakened an overhead bracket, which led to a wire dangling toward the tracks, which tangled in a train, which tore down all the lines. As a result, 47,000 commuters were stuck in Manhattan for hours. Such a small cause had such a big effect. James teaches us that one of the smallest parts of the body, the tongue, can cause a lot of damage. And I think we can all attest to that, that that's true. Words can lead to condemnation. Solomon said, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. And Benjamin Franklin also said, A slip of the foot you may soon recover, but a slip of the tongue you may never get over. Somebody fill in on that. How could maybe you could never get over a slip of the tongue? And we're going to, a lot of this stuff is going to be redundant and repetitive, but we're going to talk about it. How, how might you not ever get over a slip of the tongue? Can't take it back. And, and like I, I tell kids daily, and I know Mr. Hodgin does too, once you say that, it's out there, you can't get it back. You have no control over it. You have no control over the spin that gets put on it by the time that it's made a full circle down through there. So it, it's amazing how something said, whether with intentions or not, but once you say it, it's out there and you've lost all control over it. Words may have to be eaten. David's son said, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Be careful with words for they have consequences just five words cost Zacharias nine months of silence. Someone there, uh, look up Luke, the first chapter, verse 20. Luke 1, verse 20. Five words cost Zacharias nine months of silence. Now someone read that. How many of you could do nine months of silence? How many of you could do nine minutes of silence? I know a lot of folks that would bust if they had to had to go nine minutes with silence, but that's that all seems a, a little far-fetched and, and out, but when you study Bible verses on how things were back in biblical times, some of that stuff, do you wish that it could still apply in today's world? Not necessarily that you want someone to remain silent for nine months, but you, you get the point that I'm, that I'm trying to make. It, it seems like we, we've gotten, gotten away from that. How can our words put us in danger of sinning? Chaucer wrote, and Mr. Hodgson will have to tell you who Chaucer is. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, am I? Okay. The first virtue, son, if you will learn, is to restrain and keep well thy tongue. 
And Solomon also said, In the multitude of words, there lacketh not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Since the tongue is capable of many sins, the more we use it, the more likely we are to sin. Someone noted, and I like this, and, and I'll back up and tell it again if you, want, if you want to write it down. God gave two ears, which are always open, and one tongue surrounded by two rows of teeth, which should give us all some indication as to what he intended. And that, that makes perfect sense. We have two ears and only one tongue in order that we may hear more and speak less. And, and there's a statement here at the bottom of this that says, even a fish would stay out of trouble if he could just keep his mouth shut. And that applies to a lot of us. Applies to a lot of us. I'm sure of that. Perhaps the tongue is second only to the hand in the number of sins it can commit. The Bible lists at least 15 sins we can commit with our tongue, and we're going to talk about these 15 if we have enough time this morning. So if you want to jot them down, and, and a lot of this is repetitive, and a lot of it's one and the same, but we'll, we'll talk about all of them. 15 sins we can commit with our tongue. One, taking God's name in vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 7. God's name is taken in vain by using it flippantly. Some people use God's name in everyday speech without thinking at all about what they're saying. Some hear bad news and exclaim, My God! Another arrives at the scene of an accident and utters, Christ, what happened here? Someone wrote, and this, it's by that famous author Anonymous, and they they're, take credit for a lot of good stuff that's been written before. And listen closely to what this says. You may sport with the whirlwind and trifle with the storm. You may lay your hand upon the lion's mane and play with the leopard's spots. You may go to the very crater of the burning volcano and laugh at the lava which it belches out in thunder. You may trifle with any and everything, but trifle not with God. Let there be one holy thing upon which you dare not lay a profane hand, and let that be the name of God. God's name is taken in vain by using euphemisms. Many would never think of using holy names as interjections with nothing, let, uh, nothing less use, eu, euphemisms. An interjection is an ejaculatory word or form of speech usually thrown in with, without grammatical connection. A euphemism is the substitution of a word or phrase less offensive or objectable. Many young people have allowed words to creep into their vocabularies that should not be there. They would be shocked if they knew their origin. And we're going to, we're going to talk about some of these common euphemisms. And, and mind you, when I start going down this list, that this came from the New World uh, Webster's Dictionary. Okay, so this is how the New World Webster Dictionary defines some of these. And, and as I went through reading some of these, boy, I felt smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because I didn't really realize that. And, and some of us in here have probably used a lot of these words, and in our mind, that's not our intentions. That's not how we meant for it to be interpreted. But then again, we have no control over that. But let me tell you what some of these definitions that Webster says. The word lordy, you've heard people say lordy. Or law me refers to the Lord. Gee whiz, geese, or gee. That's a euphemistic contractions of the name of Jesus. Gosh, golly, gad, egad refers to God. Good gracious, good grief, my goodness. Goodness knows, for goodness sake, and thank goodness are mild oaths that euphemistically refer to God. Heavens, good heavens, and for heaven's sake, call on heaven to witness the truth. Dickens and deuce, I don't know how often I use the word deuce, refers to the devil, and heck refers to hell. Now, Probably a lot of you in here didn't realize that like I did. And probably a lot of us in here have used those words. And like I said, in our mind, that's not our intentions. That's not how we knew it, but that gives us something to think about. Now, how many folks 
carry that New World Dictionary around with them to check everything we say? I don't know. But it goes back to watch what we say. Second component, cursing or profanity. And, and there's tons of scripture there that relates to that. We're not going to cover all of those because there's about 12, 12 different scriptures in there. But Cursing is widespread in case you folks didn't know that. Television and movies fill scripts with four-letter words. Fiction writers can't seem to write a page without profanity. Presidents have been known to curse both on and off camera. Some people delight in peppered speech so much that they appear to exhale and inhale curse words like a fish does water. Pure speech and profanity, a popular track by Garland Elkins and Story, Story Pate, comments on the common usage of bad language in our culture, and, and this, these fellows are from the Get Well Church of Christ in Memphis. And listen to what they say, and, and this is true. People swear when they're mad and when they're glad, when they are satisfied and when they are disappointed, when they are fortunate and when they are unfortunate, when they are sick and when they are well, when they are blessed in a work or play, in earnest and in fun, and for a thousand other reasons. Now, all of you probably know someone or have known someone in here like this, and unfortunately I've known several folks that are like this, that they can't carry on the conversation without slipping a curse word in there every third, fourth word that they speak. And, and it's common to them. That's, I, I'm assuming that's just how they were brought up. I, I, don't, I don't think they went to school and was taught all that in school. How do you handle that? When you're around that type of person, it's an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> Mr. Hodgin and I deal with that a little bit. We won't call his names, Mr. Hodgin, but we deal with that a little bit. And it, it, it's it, in, this is me speculating again. In that person's mind, they're not seeing it the same way we see it. It's just words to a certain extent. So how do you handle that situation when you're, when you're with someone like that? It may be a family member. What do you do? Stay away from them if you can. What about if they're older? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to tell those young folks, you know, because in your mind you may say, well, maybe no one's ever told them that before, but when you're dealing with, you know, a person that's a grown adult and been a grown adult for a while, uh, probably the easiest remedy is, and what we do is we just try to remove ourselves from that situation. got to stay away from it. And that, that's, that's the, I won't say that's the easiest way, but that is a guaranteed fix, to stay away from it, remove yourself from that situation. And, and a lot of the time, I don't know how this affects y'all, but a lot of the times it seems this happens to me when I have a guest or I have someone that I think highly of, and then here comes this fellow that we're talking about and just being friendly and just goes to laying them out there. It, it, it gets embarrassing and, and things such as that. Paul Harvey, I don't know if you're Paul Harvey fans, but I am. Paul Harvey said, profanity is insanity. It is a prayer to God to carry out a curse of revenge. But Jesus said to love our enemies. We are to love our neighbor, not curse our neighbor. God wants all to be saved and not to be doomed. We should never with, wish others to be damned. We should wish them to be saved. Profanity is evidence of an evil heart. As a table of content tells that what, what one will find in a book, our speech tells others what they will find in our hearts. When Peter wanted to convince the Jews that he did not know Jesus, he began to curse and swear. Cursing has the same effect today. God even wants us to stay away from those who curse. Cursing keeps us from God's blessings. Third point, or, or third sin, our words could get us uh, in trouble, is flattery. Now, would you think flattery could get one in trouble? How could that be? What is flattery? I know y'all know. In, insincere, a lot of the times, insincere. Insincere. It's good to compliment, but it's sinful to flatter. 
Jesus never flattered anyone, but he did compliment five people. He said that Nathaniel was one in whom is no guile. That's in John 1 and 47. Of the Roman centurion, he said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And of John the Baptist, he said, Among them that are born of women, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He also complimented a poor widow on her giving. He complimented the woman who anointed his feet with costly oil and wiped them with her hair. Jesus complimented people for honesty, faith, fearless preaching, liberality, and doing good works. On the other hand, Jesus never flattered. Others tried to flatter him, but he never did the same. To have done so would have been, a, would, would, would have been to violate the Old Testament and his own law. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. That's in Proverbs. Job resisted the temptation of flattery. Paul never at any time used flattering words. We must give care to avoid this form of sinful speech. Somebody give me an example of how, how maybe we could, we could do that. Oh, I don't carry my mic up. Use flattery, and it worked to our disadvantage. Or, or you know that one way or the other. Yeah. Point four. Evil speaking and forwardness. What in the world would that be? Well, y'all are the elite group now. Y'all are supposed to be answering some of this left and right. Don't leave me hanging up here to do all this, Mr. Hodgins. Help us out. I hate to keep calling on you, but I know you like to talk. And that's not flattery, that's fact. Could it, could it go back to what we learned, maybe from our parents or in Head Start Kindergarten, if you don't have anything good to say? Don't say it at all. Paul wrote, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Keep thy tongue from evil and the lips from speaking guile. Point number five, and this, this is the few that, that ties in to one another as we go down through here, but they've all got their separate points. Lying and deceit. Has anybody here ever been lied to or deceived? Probably more than one occasion. More than one occasion. The ninth commandment says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Edgar J. Hahn, in an old issue of Reader's Digest, observed, A lie has speed, but truth has endurance. Somebody tell me what he's meaning by that. A lie has speed, but truth has endurance. And what is meant by a lie has endurance. Let somebody get Mr. Hodgett off the hook here. Don't let him answer all the questions. Why, why do you think it says a lie has endurance? What does that mean? It can hurt for a long time. Or it can hurt forever. Or, or whomever is a, a, a result of that may not ever get over it. But I, I thought that was a, a pretty, good, pretty good statement. A lie has speed, but truth has endurance. Solomon said, Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Why, why would people lie to us? Give me, some, give me some examples. And not necessarily, we always get to turn around, and I do, talking about teenagers. If that's, that's who I deal with. But, and the teenagers I deal with, a lot of times they'll lie to me to, Avoid getting forced to get in trouble. Avoid getting in trouble. But let's move on down to the adult road. Why? To get what they want most of the time. Most of the time they're, they're wanting something for nothing. That, that's, that's what causes them to lie or deceive you. What about uh, if y'all, every once in a while, I don't know if you have satellite TV, unfortunately I do, but if you've ever looked through there, there's about I don't know, 40 or 50 religious uh, 
television stations on there. And from time to time, I'll just turn over there and watch some of those just for kicks. It, if There's some crazy people on there, and I, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but do y'all know there's, there's one fellow on there selling holy water for $9.99? You can get a bottle of that, and all your problems will be solved. It, it's, is that a lie? Yeah. But there's a lot of people being deceived on there, and, and I'm not an advocate of that at all, but if you're bored and you've got that, just turn over there and just listen to some of that stuff on there sometimes. It's, and, and then it, it'll, it'll answer a lot of the questions for you why people, some people think the way they do. Because there's a lot of people sitting there watching that stuff, taking it in and believing everything that's said on there. And they're being deceived. Point six, tail-bearing. Gossip is dangerous, and, and this is one of my favorite subjects. I guess it's because it's probably the most easiest one to get caught up in. Gossip is dangerous because it wounds, it separates friends, it sows strife, and digs up evil. And it snares the gossiper's own soul and is classed with the worst of evils. According to the National Opinion Research Center, 29% of adults say their privacy has been violated by gossiping neighbors. And uh, I would have thought that was a rather small percentage. Tell me, in today's world, how gossip can be prevalent, more so than it ever has been before. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not knocking anyone in here, but... Uh, Mel and I, my, we don't have Facebook, we don't have, I call it slap chat and insta slam because that's what it turns into for me at school every day. But, but we don't do that. And a lot of people, and, and we've talked about this, that a lot of people are obsessed with that. Is that bad? I don't know. Is it good? Probably not. And, and there's, a, there's, there's a time and a place for Facebook, and I, and I understand that and all that stuff. If you've got relatives that that live way off and you don't get to see them and where it took you six days to get a letter back from them, now you can you know, do it instantly on that. But unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of people are on there just to see what's going on. Just to see what's going on and, and comment on it. And, and Mr. Hodgen can testify to this probably, and you correct me if you feel like I'm wrong, 90 or 95 percent of the problems we deal with at school at Wheeler derives from this stuff right here. Mobile patrol, I don't have it, don't want it. But I think almost every one of my staff members do, and I have to get on to them. They stay on there just to see who pops up. They want to know if one of our parents pops. Yeah, that could be a good thing, you know, if, if it was something that, that we really needed to know, if it was a, a child abuse case or something like that. But people have turned, uh, this stuff like this has caused people to be way more nosier than what they ought to be. They've got too much time on their hands. That's time you could be spending doing something else but it's it's the nature of the beast and, and it causes us to probably to gossip and, and all of that stuff but, uh, it, it let, me, let me tell you a few facts here it talks about gossip and, and I read this a long time ago I, don't, I wish I knew where I read it I would go back and get it but it was an old Chinese proverb and I tell my kids this and I tell my, my staff this and this makes a lot of sense if you really think about it gossip it's like throwing mud on a clean wall. It don't always stick, but it leaves a stain. Somebody, some of you deep thinkers tell me what that means. It don't always stick, but it leaves a stain. It hurts people. And, and, and it's, it, it, we're going to talk about it here in a little bit, it has driven some people over the edge. Some people have taken their own lives because gossip that's gotten out there and gotten spread and gotten out of control. There is nothing as effective as a bunch of facts to spoil a good rumor. How many people think that way that you know? Nothing like a bunch of good facts to spoil a good rumor. There's a new margarine on the market named Rumor because it spreads so quickly and easily. That's just a, a funny pun there on how how gossip has, has gotten out of hand. Is it easy to get caught up in gossiping? 
probably more easier than anything we've talked about so far today. It's, it's hard. It's hard to avoid it. It's hard to, uh, and Mr. Hodge and I have talked about this before, uh, and he and I are sitting in my office, you know, and we never did really come up with an answer, Mr. Hodge, and somebody in here may can. If it's fact, is it gossip? No, go ahead. That's a fine line. Right. It, it's it's kind of like the statement I made, I think it was one of my Wednesday night classes of a gentleman I knew, and, and his very words to me one time was, this is not hearsay, somebody told me this. It, it, and that's how... <laughs> That's how he started letting me fill me that information. And he believed that. I really do think he believed that. This ain't hearsay. Somebody told me this. So it had to have been fact. And a lot of people operate that way. Uh, point seven, harsh criticism and reveling. A good statement to remember is, to belittle is to be little. There's another one of those deep thought sentences. To belittle is to be little. What does that mean? In other words, in order to keep a man down, you've got to be down there with him. It, it, it's, it's a pretty good way to look at that. In order to keep a man down, you've got to be down there with him. And, and this goes into what we are talking a little bit ago about gossip. Uh, one woman committed suicide and left an unfinished note that simply said, they said. They said. Whatever they said, had bothered her enough that she thought life was not any longer worth living. One can never whitewash himself by slinging mud at another. He who tries only gets his hands dirty. It doesn't hurt to be kind. It may not, may not always be easy to be nice, but it's worth the effort. As Christians, we need to be very sensitive to the needs and feelings of others. One noted that if you call a lady an old hen, you're in trouble but she doesn't mind being referred to as a chick. Tell her she looks like a breath of spring instead the end of a hard winter. Although it may mean the same thing, it's better to say, time stands still when I look into your eyes than to say, you have a face that would stop a clock. <laughs> it matters what we say and how we say it. Point eight. Whispering. Now, now this is one that, that sort of caught me off guard and I never really, really thought about this. Whispering. On a windswept hill in an English country churchyard stands a drab, gray, slate tombstone. Bleak and unpretentious, it leans slightly to one side, beaten slick and thin by the blast of time. The quaint stone bears an epitaph not easily seen unless you stoop over and look closely. The faint etching reads, Beneath this stone, a lump of clay, lies Arabella Young, who on the 24th day of May began to hold her tongue. Somebody elaborate on that. What's that telling us? She finally shut up, for lack of a better word. Don't be like Arabella. Learn to control your speech while you still have a choice. Point nine, and, and this is something we're all familiar with, boasting. Some young people are constantly talking about themselves and what they have done or think they can do. Whatever we have done is simply because God gave us the ability and opportunity to do it. Therefore, he alone deserves the praise and the glory. 
And, and back this talks about young people again. Is young people the only ones that is tied into boasting? No. And, and y'all all probably have known some of that type of person, and, and I think the term used for it is one-upmanship. Whatever you've done, they've done it better, and, and, and things like that. We had an old gentleman there in Wheeler years ago that had moved in, whole family had moved in from California years ago, and I'm not sure he ever farmed anything, but to hear him talk, he farmed. And we were sitting around the store there at Wheeler one day, and they were talking about how good the cotton crop was that year, how big the cotton plants was that year, and the biggest that ever had, the best crop that ever had. And, and I remember him saying, well, that's nothing. Back in California, we grew it so big you had to stand on the bottom stalk to pick it. Now, I don't know if he ever grew any cotton or not, but he was that type of fellow that no matter what you did, he done it better. What, what do we see? Uh, tell us what profession maybe that we see boasting or bragging on TV again. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. And, and yes, that's probably intentional, but the, the motivation behind that is money, to make money and all this. But how do you handle that person that, that's always bragging that they're better or they could do it better or that dreaded person that always comes around after you've done something be it build a park bench or whatever and they sit there and tell you tell you what I'd have done if I was doing it y'all know that type of person that always comes in with that how do you handle that do you cut them off do you just tell them was it Yogi Bear I don't remember if it's Yogi Bear or not said if it's if you could do it it's not bragging and I'm not sure on that if you talk about being able to do it, would be the bragging part about it, I guess. But, but there's a lot of that that goes on. And a lot of the times, if you're that type of person that just outright just calls their hand, and will show me. A lot of the times, they can't do that. Exactly. I can remember when I was in junior high, I played for, for Mike Anderson. I loved him today. I thought as much of him as I did anybody. And we had one kid that, uh, and I think he was serious about this, kept wanting Coach Anderson to get her name on the back. He wanted his name on the back of his jersey. This is junior high now. He wanted his name on the back of his jersey. And he kept hounding Coach Anderson about that and hounding him. And I remember Coach Anderson distinctly telling him, he said, son, if you're good enough, everybody will know your name. You won't need it on the back of your jersey. And, and that, that goes a long way, and that's stuck with me ever since you me made that statement. Yes, ma'am. It could. It, it could, especially, and, I, and I've seen a lot of that in, in real, young, real young kids that, that yeah, right, to, to cover up the way things really are a lot of the times. I agree. we got to hurry up because we're almost, uh, I've got too much soap going on today. Point 10, backbiting. All biting is not done with the teeth. Some is done with the tongue, and compared to the teeth, the tongue is sharper. A backbiter is not a person who bites back, but one who bites behind the back. A backbiter is a person with back trouble. Backbite means to say a mean or spiteful thing about one who's absent, to slander. The Hebrew word suggests the idea of to play the spy. Backbiters keep bad company and start church troubles. If a backbiter comes near us, the Bible tells us to give them a dirty look. Literally, if you will read Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 3. Moving right along hurriedly, 11, speaking idle words or foolish talking. And, and listen closely to this. We may not have time to finish this. If we don't, we'll pick up some other time. A farmer came to town one day and asked the owner of a restaurant if he could use a million frog legs. The owner asked where he could get that many frogs. The farmer told him, I've got a pond at home just full of them. They drive me crazy night and day. After they made an agreement for several hundred frogs, the farmer went back home. He came back a week later with two scrawny frogs and a foolish look on his face. I guess I was wrong, he said. There were just two frogs in that pond, but they sure were making a lot of noise. The next time you hear a lot of noise about how bad things are at church or in the youth group, just remember, it may be nothing more than a couple of complainers who have a negative attitude and like to talk. 
We're out of time. We didn't get all the way through, but if I'm asked to do this again, we'll, we'll try to finish this up. Thank you for your time.